about. All right, friends, we are um, having Math Crush Monday. We are talking today about small groups. So raise your hand if you run small groups in your classroom. Um, specifically, I wanted to address kindergarten tonight, um, but I think that this idea of small groups is appropriate for all grade levels of just something that I want us to consider and to think about. Um, I actually have a blog post on this that I will post below. Um, so if you want to do some deeper reading about it and thinking about it, um, you might enjoy that blog post. But um, we're talking tonight again about small groups. Again, let me know below in the comments if you're um, watching the replay, if you're watching live, if you run small groups, how often you run small groups, maybe say second grade every day. Second grade during core instruction, do you teach small groups during when, what I need block? Um, tell me a little bit about when you're doing small groups. So I have a, 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 a unique take on small groups. Um, I used to do guided math a lot, especially when I was in the classroom. And I love the idea of guided math, um, but there were some flaws with it, right? And then I went into more of a, um, a whole group model. Um, and then I found some flaws with the whole group model. And so now I've settled into this more balanced approach. And I would say that expressions is actually more around the balanced approach. Remember that if you look at the teacher's guide, you should be able to look at the guide. And let me see if I have a, an example here. And it'll tell you when in the lesson that, oh gosh, we're knocking over stuff, um, that it suggests small group. Now, this is just a recommendation. You don't have to do it, but I want you to see because so many people say, well, it's just so much whole group. It's so much of the teacher at the front, so much direct instruction. That's not true. That's how you're interpreting the guide. Okay, so you're still the teacher in that room and trying to engage all of your students and keep them going. I think it's more about you understanding the role of the small group and the role of the whole group for you to decide what's going to best meet your students' needs. Okay, so a reminder, it kind of depends on which copyright you're using. If you're using the 2018 copyright, you have this kind of guide right here where it tells you like one head, two heads, three heads, etc. And then it will show you that here. So like there's you know, several heads right there. That means that's whole class. That one stands for whole class. So it means, hey, this activity, you should do whole class. But as we go through the activities, this one might be, actually it's whole group until you get to activity two. And then activity two, it actually has two people. Okay, two heads, where did that go right there? Okay, and that means that it, it's intended or we think that kids would be better in partner work. Now we're kind of releasing and we're letting students go to some more um, small group or partner type activities. Okay, so just know that that's in there and that's how they're gonna have you uh, or suggest how you should go to small group, but you can do different things. You don't have to stay in whole group that whole time. But what I do want you to understand is that whole group is intended for inquiry launches, I do whole group when I'm starting a concept, okay? So when I feel like um, we are just starting long division and I want to throw out a collaborative problem and see what students will do with it, maybe I've given them base 10 blocks in fourth grade and I've given them, the, you know, one problem from the workbook, but I've shown it up on an overhead or projected it and I wanted to see what kids know. Okay, it's for me, that's a formative assessment. It tells me what students are bringing to the table, but it also gives students a chance to be mathematicians and try to solve something without being explicitly or directly told how yet. Okay, so as I'm watching kids solve, whether it's in kindergarten, it's in first grade, it does not matter. Uh, let's just say we're, we're learning something for the first time, okay? I wanna see the types of ideas that are out there and I want all the learners in my room to be a part of this because I'm trying to build the concept concrete representation and abstract. I need someone in the room who knows like an algorithm or knows how to do some repeated subtraction or knows maybe the numbers. Okay. I need someone else that like literally is physically moving and sharing blocks. If we're going to my fourth grade example, and then I need someone who's drawing and kind of representing how many equal shares each person gets. And my job then is to connect those three models, the concrete, the representation, and the abstract. I want all students to have equal access to that content. Okay, so now that I get a feel and now I'm going to bring it to explicit instruction. Okay, so that's phase one inquiry approach. I'm in whole group because I need all those voices. I need all of those methods and that initial idea. We don't have to finish the problem. Okay, it's just enough to see what's out there. 
Then I'm pulling problems or I'm pulling what kids have done their work. And now I am directly, explicitly teaching whatever it is my goal is of for the day, but I'm using their work to guide me. The teacher's guide tells me what the end goal is. It tells me the types of problems I should be posting. It tells me the type of math talk kids should be having, right? But then I'm using their work to drive that instruction. Now, once I'm there, I'm technically in the inquiry phase, phase two, where we're exploring various methods. So maybe today we're exploring one of the methods like place value sections. We're exploring some of the different algorithms right? It might be the whole day is just on that. Well, I might start with one problem whole group to see what kids have. Having kids do math talk, listening to each other. Well, do you agree or disagree in your group? See if you know what the next step is. I'm facilitating learning in a whole group atmosphere. But then I do start to see more of maybe a great divide. I've allowed for kids to use concrete tools, representations, and algorithms, and I'm connecting them. But then maybe on day two of that lesson, or maybe like in this example, when I get to activity two, now I might pull small groups because now I want to give some direct feedback to students with where they're at in that learning path. So students that still need to be building with blocks, I might have them come back to my back table and connect them to that representation and see if I can move them forward in their own progression. Okay, the same thing if they're in that representation stage, I need to move them forward into that final stage, okay, so of abstract. So I feel like small group is when we've already had some basic whole group instruction, some good feedback, collaborative learning. We've heard different voices in the room. We've heard, uh, we've seen all the different ways that students might be thinking about it. We're creating flexibility, but now I want students to get some individual feedback um, or some more guided instruction, possibly. Okay, small group can look differently in that way. Um, and then I, so now maybe tomorrow I might be in small groups. So my issue is this, when I, I was recently in a kindergarten classroom with a fabulous kindergarten teacher, and she's running small groups, okay, and she's running small groups every single day. I actually, if I were teaching kindergarten, again, um, I would be running small groups often also because some of your class sizes, my friends, are like 25, 30 kinders, five-year-olds, right? And that's a lot of kids to manage with all of those manipulatives and tools, especially from expressions. But there were some issues with running small groups. So here's some of the things I saw. They're using their, I'm gonna share my screen here. They're using their um, uh, build 120 mat. So hold on, let me go back out there. Um, and let me show you. So you'll, I think you'll be able to relate to this if you are uh, teaching small group every day. I think you're gonna see the same type of an issue. Okay, so check, check out this. So here is um, this teen mat. So we do this in kindergarten a lot in unit four. We actually introduce it in unit three and then it goes through to unit five, it's forever, okay? So we're doing these teen numbers. Well, we're pulling these small groups, but because we're in kinder and she has all of these other stations set up, she's really only able to meet with each group for let's say seven minutes. Max is what she's able to meet with because of their stamina, because of she's having to rotate other groups. It took her a long time to explain the stations, you know, et cetera. So she gets kids in, the, in this group and she gives them each one card and she has them build that team number. So let's say one kid, kid builds 13 and another kid builds 16, right? And the, from the few, few groups that I saw, they all built their number right? And she's guiding a lot of them. There was, you know, several like six kids or something in there and she's watching as they build it. But the whole time is really taken up of her watching build, which there's value to watching kinders build things 100%. You know what though? They only got one number. They built one number. And if you look at this particular example, when we're looking at um, this kindergarten example, one of the more important things is that kids have built all the numbers from 11 to 20, because a good conversation now is how they're different, right? How is 11 different from 12? How is 12 different from 13? We want kids to start to see this pattern of this growing pattern, right? And notice that we're one more, one more, one more, or what happens if I go backwards? What's the same? Oh, we all have a group of 10. Right. I want to be able to take the, the goal of the lesson. And if an I'm in small group, I want that small group time to be the goal of the lesson. And the goal of the lesson in these cases is to get kids to have conversation around team numbers. They, in order to do that, they have to build 
all of the teen numbers, or at least enough of the teen numbers for us to have this really good conversation. Okay, so maybe it's that we're in unit five now in kindergarten, and unit five is more now about we've been building teen numbers forever, but do kids remember that 15 could be a group of 10 and five extra ones, but they, do they also know it is just 15 ones? So if I had like all these stars over here, right, it's the idea of I can circle a group of 10 and then I have a couple extra and I built a team number versus some of our kids just use this 10 stick. And in this exa example, in this kindergarten classroom, she had some, um, students that were really struggling and they knew just to pull the 10 stick and to pull some extra ones, but they didn't really understand that that 10 stick was worth 10 ones. Right. So then that could be the goal of her instruction of really asking, well, how do I know that's 15? And if they say, well, because it has a group of 10, I could say, well, show me the group of 10. Friends, let's turn and talk to our neighbor in our small group and show them how you know there's 10. Let's double count all of those. Okay, so the problem, though, was it's been the whole time just building a single number. We didn't have any conversation around really the goal of the lesson because she just ran out of time. Right. So then we start thinking more creatively, like, could we have had two tables running? Because I know why we do small group, right? We do it to help manage all of those tools and to give some more direct feedback and support to students wherever they're at in their own learning progression. OK, so I know that's why we, we're, we're doing it. But we have to be able to get to the heart of the lesson. If you're teaching third grade and you're running stations for small group every day, you're probably only seeing kids for 10 minutes each. You're telling me that as much as I've heard complaints about this, that there's a 60 minute lesson in here. Let me grab all my stuff. Okay? There's a 60 minute lesson expressions is designed around and you're fitting in that entire lesson of examples and feedback and math talk where kids should be defending and reasoning, um, practice, all of that in 10 minutes. They're not getting enough core instruction. Okay. They need more core instruction before you pull them into that small group because they need 60 minutes of core instruction, 60 minutes on this lesson. Now, if you're like, well, I'm only gonna do this part of my small group and then I'm gonna run into this other activity and that's what they're gonna work on when they're not with me. Fabulous, but they have to be ready for that. And is there someone there giving them feedback or was 10 minutes enough instruction to release them to go do that other work? And if you're like, well, no, it's not. So I've given them other like scaffolded ideas and other stations to work on while I am working with my small groups. That's fine if it's a win time, what I need block. Or if it's fine if you're only running small groups a couple times a week because it really is about practicing with your kids now and giving them that direct feedback. And you're not also trying to teach a lesson, right? So that there, there's kind of becomes a breakdown there of the main thing I saw is those kids did not get enough instruction in today's lesson. So were they practicing teen numbers in some other stations? Yes, but we never actually got to the heart or the rigor of the lesson of kids hearing and thinking and talking about math. So we build all those teen numbers and we're just lit, like, what do you notice now about these numbers? Let's use some math talk stems. 11 is different from 12 because I know that 13 is not 14 because are we getting to that or are we spending our time having to quickly like tell kids how to do the math? They only see them for 10 minutes. So I'm just going to like explicitly show you and tell you there's no inquiry. There's no kids trying on their own, really. It's just me telling. Pros and cons. Okay, so in this particular example, we were brainstorming. So could we have had two different groups? So like kids at this kinder table and kids at this kinder table, and both tables were building all of their teen numbers. Okay, meanwhile, I'm popping back and forth between the two tables and asking some good converse, um, to good questions. Well, how do you know that's 14? And oh, why don't you recount that one? And boys and girls, if you're in peanut butter and jelly partners, peanut butter, would you turn to jellies and count their teen numbers? Check 16. It doesn't look like 16. Does it count to 16? Because I can't check all those work. Like that's a lot of kids to check every single math. Okay, so I'm going to utilize partner talk for that. And so I'm helping facilitate the building of teen numbers because there's a lot of learning that's happening there. Um, and then when, you know, I decided I spent, let's say, 20 minutes doing that, now I'm going to meet with both of those groups separately. This group over here is going to leave their, their mats already built. They already have all their teen numbers built. They're going to stand up, leave them, go to a different station, work on whatever, you know, maybe it was writing numbers because their workbook page happening about writing their teen numbers. Great. That means we're still getting in that core instruction. It's still goal, a part of the goal of today, right? 
But then when they, in the group I'm meeting with, they've already built their numbers. So I'm getting to the heart of the matter. I've got enough kids there that are mixed levels on purpose, right? So that we can now have really good conversation about what they're seeing. And I'm building math conversation. Maybe I'm noticing I pulled the kids specifically that kept miscounting. And those are the kids that are going to stay with their mats. And we're going to have conversation around that. I have other kids that are thinking more high level and they're ready to have some deeper questions. Maybe I pull them into that small group real quick, but I've watched them all build it. The buildings happen. We spent a bulk of our time doing the actual core lesson. I spent 20 minutes doing that, and then 20 minutes meeting in two small groups. So remember, small group doesn't have to be six kids in a core instruction block. Small group can be half the class. Now, when I'm in intervention, when I go to win time, the what I need block, that I want you to do in small groups. I want six to, eight kids, six to eight kids, and it's more direct, it's more explicit, it's very skill-focused generally, and that particular group. Okay. But during core instruction, if I'm running small group, it has to get to the heart of the lesson and kids need still full 60 minutes with today's concepts at the rigor that they need it. So I'm not suggesting you stay in whole group all the time, every time. I'm just suggesting that when we go to small group, it's because we've already built the concept well enough that kids are ready to go practice in partners. Why I pull a small group that may not be ready to practice in partners. Or if we're going to do like rotation stations, okay, I've made sure that we have multitasked enough or we've started as a whole group or we've done stations first and then we can reconvene as a whole group so we can have some of those deep conversations and ensure we're getting the math talk in that we need to get in. So friends, would you post below, say something below about something you just heard that maybe you disagree with. Okay, or you're wrestling with, you're still thinking about this, or my, my principal says we have to meet in small group. And again, I think it's doable, but I don't think it should be every day for the entire time. I think you're missing valuable opportunities in a, an inquiry-based program where we are listening to each other be good mathematicians. Okay, so when I think about reading, there's a reason we have shared reading. We don't only ever read kids to kids decodable books. We read chapter books and novels and picture books that are way beyond their reading level because we're exposing them to the story. Think of that with mathematics. I want them to be exposed to the full story. I'm connecting them at all their different levels. I don't feel like I have to do all these small groups because I was able to um, give access to the math to everyone in the whole group. Then I can pull small groups to create that where we need to practice. Practice. What zone are you in for practice? Now, maybe I'll pull you in a small group for that. All right, friends. So that was one example. Um, if I were to show you just one more here in kinder, because it just keeps coming up for me. So here's another one. We're doing waking bugs. And this is about them doing partners of 10. Okay. So that one of the big important parts of this is that kids are waking up bugs. Like, oh, how many bugs are awake? Six. You can see the little eyeball. Okay. How many are asleep? Four. Okay. Six and four are partners of 10. And then this teacher is writing the chart 10 equals. And then we write down the partners of 10. Okay. Well, if you're in a small group, are you getting and having kids think about how they knew there were six? Well, I knew it was because it was five and one. Are they getting that conversation opportunity? And then are they getting the charting activity in full because you have to get the full chart in order for you to have these conversations about patterns of 10, that it, that it um, goes in ascending order, and then it goes in descending order, that 10 is always the total. There's all of these things that can only happen if we have the entire chart made and kids have had the experience of building all the numbers. So then when I go to small group, maybe I'm focusing on uh, how they knew it was six and four or some of the, the smaller component, but I can't do this in an entire small group for all those different groups and get to the entirety rigor of the lesson. I just can't get to it. it. There's not enough time. So then I end up having kids do like these counting bear activities and other things that aren't bad, but it's not to the rigor of this lesson. It's not the intention of that lesson. Okay. So there's other times in kinder where I'm like, by all means, like what we're doing today, we've done it like a hundred times. We've done this activity. We've done, you know, X, Y, and Z. Like it's going to just be a small group day for the whole core lesson. And because when that kids come to me, I'm touching on specific things I've been noticing and we're just rehearsing the other activities and those other small groups. They're going to do a, go do the waking bug activity by themselves this time. We don't need to build it in a whole class. They're going to go practice those fluency pages in their workbook. We don't need to do that in a whole class. But when they come to me, I'm going to make sure that I'm touching on all that little stuff I've been seeing formatively during the week. 
or during the last few lessons, right? So again, tell me something that you've, you're hearing, something you're going to try, maybe something that's just making you think about small groups and maybe how you're running it. I specifically gave you a kindergarten example. I gave some upper grades at the start of our time today, um, but I want you just to be thinking about that it's not all or nothing. And if you're choosing to go to small group more often, then are you getting to the heart and to the rigor of the lesson? Or do you feel like you're having to be a drill sergeant and just show kids how to do it? And they're really only getting the one, maybe two problems. And they're really, you're watching them just compute. Or are they problem solving and talking to neighbors and hearing three different ways they might be able to solve? And that's a big part of the mathematics classroom. Okay, so do I have that balanced approach? That's what I want you to ask yourself. You'll also know that I am a big proponent of small group, even though this Facebook Live may not say that I am. I am, okay, because I, I see where we've got to get our hands on kids in the sense of like, get to that student and have conversations with them and guide them and instruct them. They need explicit direct instruction. I see that. My only caveat is when, where, and how they need it. But at what point in the lesson is it most beneficial so that they're not with me for 10 minutes and that 10 minutes was awesome, but now there's 50 minutes where they're flailing in those other stations because they don't have enough information to get th those done. Okay, so we want to make sure we have that balanced approach. I also want those kids to know that they are a mathematician and they can do it. And it becomes real hard for them to do that when they're in the low group with the teacher every day and I'm holding their hand every day. It is no secret to them that that's happening and that's not equitable mathematics, okay? So there's ways around it. There's ways for us to meet those needs while also providing for those social emotional needs. All right, friends, I hope that helps. Just think through, maybe if nothing else, just plant some ideas, some things that you're thinking about. But would you let me know you're, you saw the video? Just hit like or love or say, I watched it or say, I totally disagree or anything. Would you just have a conversation with me and let me know what you're thinking? I sure would love to hear from you. Thank you, my friend. Happy Math Crush Monday. If there's other topics you'd like for us to discuss, make sure you post them below. Thanks, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.